Guitar practice session 10, 12, 24. These are fairly sloppy practice sessions where I practice whatever I think I need to be working on, hoping they generate a routine for me, help me verbalize what I'm trying to work on and get it in my mind better, possibly provide information to others working on similar things, as well as possibly providing for feedback if anybody sees a better way to do the things that I'm going to be doing here. I do think that practice sessions are useful to try to pretend like you're uh, giving the information to someone else, even if no one else is listening, because it helps to verbalize the information. So if you want to take the resources we have here and do the same thing, uh, take the Excel worksheet and do whatever you want with it. Don't worry about plagiarism or anything like that. You can do your own practice sessions if you want or do whatever you want with it. So the worksheet will be a little bit different than possibly other worksheets you have seen. Our goal here is to put everything in a perspective where it's as easy to see the fretboard as possible so we can work on the shapes of the fretboards and the intervals and whatnot from the perspective of playing the guitar meaning if you were behind the guitar and you pressed the guitar on the page here we would then have the low or heavy string on top the one closest to the ceiling top to the bottom left to the right in the same orientation as you from behind the guitar i'm also going to flip my guitar around so it looks like i'm left-handed so it will once again have top to bottom left to right same orientation as you from behind uh, the guitar we're going to be looking at position number five is what i call it we'll name it different ways you might call it a mixolydian position for example or possibly an a-shaped position from a caged uh, perspective we're looking at the what i call absolute mode number two uh, the dorian mode once again this time we're going to be going from the bottom of the shape here and then looking at the intervals around the horn back to the top of the shape uh, up top now we're going to spend a lot more time this time uh, going through those shapes, not only looking at the intervals, but now trying to apply the concept that we got from intervals and inverse intervals to each of the notes uh, that we that we go to. So we're going to say, okay, if I go to the second one, this is the second of the scale. And then we're going to say the second is the E. How could I build a chord from it uh, using the three note triad chord but then possibly going on beyond that and thinking about the seven nine eleven and thirteen so in order to do that we can we can build our chord normally with a bar chord basically moving forward or looking back towards it but when we start at the bottom of the guitar a lot of times that's harder for many people including me because then we have to look up to the guitar to find my intervals like the third and the fifth Normally, we think about intervals as though we're on the top of the guitar, like the E up here, and then we move down to the left, down to the right, and like a bar chord when we're thinking to the, to the, down to the right, and like a, a C shape or a G shape when we think about leaning down to the left. So that means that our inverse intervals could be a very good tool for us to try to build our chord shapes when I'm thinking of myself on the bottom strings here, because we can then say... Well, if I need a third, I can look up above it and say, what would be the inverse of a third so that I can then figure it out from top to bottom and then, and then that will give me my third. So we're going to start using our intervals that way uh, and start to build our chords more as we go through each of the notes in the shape. And that'll spend, we'll spend most of our time this time doing that. We'll be thinking of our shape from the perspective of the, the, the house analogy and the five note pentatonic analogy, also thinking about where these, uh, these modes are in relation to those shapes as we go through our exercise. I have a joke like in the middle of it somewhere. It's not the greatest joke, but it was, it was you know, so that's in there. It's not political this time, so it shouldn't piss anyone off. And, and uh, that's basically it. Continuing on with what I would call position number five, looking at what I would call mode number two, that being the Dorian mode, remembering that we're using an absolute numbering system based on our Rosetta Stone, our point of reference, that being the major scale, otherwise known as the Ionian mode. So here's the major scale or Ionian mode. We have the relative positions on the left, the first through the seventh. 
We have the notes on the right, which are going to be in the key of C, no sharps and flats. And we've named the modes based on the same relative positions as the major scale or Ionian mode. Now we're going to be moving to what I would call mode number two, which is going to have a different set of relative positions, meaning same notes but they're going to be ordered differently, which is important because we still want to be able to understand the intervals in the new ordering. But if we can refer back to the base major scale Ionian mode with the use of the absolute mode numbers, that will help to orientate us. So as we go to the Dorian, we're now in the Dorian mode. We have a different set of relative positions, still one through seven. Same notes, but they're ordered differently. Now we're starting on D because the D Dorian is the relative Dorian to the C major scale. Still no sharps and flats that we are going to be playing. And when we look at the modes now, Dorian is mode number two because it's two relative to the major scale. And then we can see the modes from there, the modes helping us to determine whether we make a minor chord or a major chord. And beyond that, if we know the intervals of the modes, then we can go and make more complex chords and know that those chords are still gonna be in the same key as the key that we're playing in, which is gonna be the key of D Dorian in this case. With regards to the intervals, remember the interval ordering session is that I would first remember the intervals in the major key, and then we memorize the intervals in the related minor, which is the Aeolian, what I would call mode number six. And then we compare the other major modes, which would be mode number four, Lydian, mode number five, Mixolydian, to the major key, because those are major modes, and we compare the minor modes, the Dorian that we're on now, and the Phrygian, to the relative or main minor mode, that being the Aeolian mode. So we're on the Dorian. Let's just walk through the different uh, intervals that we would take a look at. We've got the perfect first. What does this numbering mean? It means that we're on the first position of the Dorian and it would just be the same note, right? We would just be playing the D if I play it down here. D, 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 <laughs> For, right? And then we have the second of the Dorian, uh, the second of the Dorian is uh, 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 a two note away minor major second, which most of the even the minors are right majors and minors usually have that major second. And then the third of the Dorian is a three note away minor third. So this little m3 means minor third. The third means it's the third note in the position, which is why we really need to reorientate the Dorian. So it's the first note so that we can count all of the intervals related to it, but still use the, the this numbering system for the modes, which can help us to orientate us to the major scale, which hopefully we can, we can memorize the, the major scale. So that's going to be a, a minor third. So if I was uh, going here, whoa, hold on, I dropped my pick. I dropped my pick. So it would be like, if this is like position three, this is what I call the Dorian position, even though we're going to be playing up here. But I want, but now I'm just playing it from the top in what I would call the Dorian position just to look at these intervals. And then we've got the perfect, the, the fourth, which is a five note away perfect fourth. So the perfect fourth is going to be the same in the majors and the minors. The four represents the fact that it's the fourth position. And this five in front of it is not something that everybody uses, but I use because it tells me how many actual half steps away it is, which a lot of people don't really memorize on the guitar. They just kind of memorize the shape. So I want to keep on repeating in my mind the number of intervals so I can prove to myself uh, what is five, you know, a five note away. So it's going to be here right underneath. That's going to be a five note away perfect fourth. And then the fifth is going to be a seven note away perfect fifth. So once again, the perfect fifths are the same in the major and uh, the minors or the main major and the main minor. And this five represents the fifth position. Seven notes away is the number of half steps between the notes. And we'll count those half steps shortly, but that's the idea on the intervals. And then the six, this is the one that's different from the Dorian to the main minor mode, which is the Aeolian. It has a nine note away uh, major six instead of what you would expect from a minor mode like the Dorian, a minor six, which would be 10 notes away. 
So the, the major six represents this six over here. Nine notes away is gonna be the distance uh, of it. So that looks like this. That's the basic shape typically. And then we have the uh, seventh, which is gonna be a 10 note away minor seven, 10 note away minor seven, and then back to the octave. So that's how it is up in uh, where the D is up top. So now we're gonna go, I'm gonna go from the bottom up to the top. Wait a sec, we already did that last time. I'm gonna go from this D around the horn to this D. And as we do that, we're going to, we're gonna also try to look at the, each of these notes and build at least a minor chord from it and possibly beyond that we go we go and, and look at some of these more complex uh, fingerings the 7 9 11 and 13 so remember the idea of do I make a triad do I make a three note chord uh, is a question of the third is the third major or minor that's all we have to know and we can know that the major modes are gonna have a major third and a minor modes are gonna have the minor third. And if you compare that to the major key, we know that the one, four, five have the major, are the major modes that will have a major third. And then the three, the two, three, and six are gonna have a minor third. But beyond that, if we can learn the actual modes, then we can sit, we can have more complex chords because that's not going to be enough to tell us whether we have a major or minor seven a major or minor nine a major or minor 11 or 13. it's not enough to know that it's a major or minor mode the other thing that confuses people a lot is when we when we build chords based on the based on the scale when i say it's a minor chord then I, I start to think in my mind well the whole thing now i'm in the minor key right so if i'm in like the dorian mode and then I switch to the Phrygian, I start to think, well, maybe I'm now in, since this is a minor mode and it has a minor chord to it, a minor third, maybe I just switch to the minor key. But that's not necessarily the case if you're playing in the same mode as like the Dorian. You, 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 you could play the parallel mode. I could play a D Dorian uh, here and then go to an E Dorian using all the same intervals as the Dorian. But when I do that, I'm then going out of the Dorian key, right? Uh, because because both the D Dor both the E Dorian and the E Phrygian are going to have a minor third, so it's going to have the same triad, but they're going to have a distinction, especially with the second, because the second of the Phrygian has a minor second, whereas the Dorian has a major second. So, so there's a difference between the two. So we could do that. We could do the parallel. Like when I'm switching keys, this might be easier on the major. Like if I go through the major and then I switch from the one to the four to the five, I could switch entirely and play all the notes in Mixolydian that are now, I'm sorry, all the notes in the five, which have a major chord construction, a major third. I could play it as though it's a major key with all the same notes in the major scale. But there's going to be a distinctive note that is not in the key of C. When I do that, the distinctive note in Mixolydian being the seventh has a minor seventh. So that might still work because you're simply you're playing something parallel to what is in the C. That's fine. But the other way we can do it is not switching to to a G major, but switching to a G Mixolydian. If I think of myself as in a G Mixolydian, then I have all the same notes as in the, the C major. And that means that when I, when I get to a more complex chord, I add the minor seventh, because the minor seventh will still be in the key of C major. And so that's, that's the idea with the modes. So if we, if we look at these more complex or these higher up uh, intervals with regards to when we make a chord, when we make a chord, we name the intervals thusly, right? We go, we take every other note. So we go one, skip the two to the three, skip the four to the five, skip the six to the seven, uh, skip the eight to the nine, skip the nine to the 11, uh, I'm sorry, skip the 10 to 11, skip the 12 to the 13. Now you might say, hey, there's only, there's only seven notes. How does that even work? And what we're doing is we're just saying this nine is equivalent to the two we skipped this 11 is equivalent to the four we skipped and this 13 is equivalent to the six uh, uh, that we skipped. 
So there's only the seven, it's the same intervals, we just name them differently because when we build a chord, we pick every other note, generally because picking every other note gives more distance between the notes, which gives you less of that uh, kind of tensiony sound. But realize that that on a piano you would play these notes. You can imagine these notes uh, spaced out and having at least a space one space note in between, meaning one half step in between. But on a guitar, when we get to the ninth, again we just play the two. We're probably going to look for the two if there's a nine in it. I'm going to look for any two that's available. I'm not really going to be thinking octave. I need it to be up an octave because. I, I, I can't reach that far. I don't have two hands, unless you were doing the two hand thing on the guitar, then you're not really gonna be able to play, you, you're gonna reach what you can reach means. So that means that the two, uh, the 11, the thir I mean the nine, the 11, the 13 is the two, four, six, which if it's in the same octave, it's gonna add more tension probably, right? So, so that gives you some more kind of uh, structure on it. So we'll possibly try to think about that as we go through, okay. So let's go to this, we're in this position now in what I would call position number five. So position number five is here. What do we call this position? I call it position five because if I break the guitar into five pieces, then I would call this generically position number one. There's only five positions, therefore the position behind it is position number five. You can also call it a, a mixolydian position because if I started on the G, the first note, I would be playing in Mixolydian. Okay, but I'm gonna be starting from the D, so even though we're using a Mixolydian position, we're gonna be playing in Dorian, D Dorian. So you could also try to name it each of the positions by, the, by what you're playing. So I could say it's a one, two, three, four, a five note, the fifth note of the scale Dorian position. I'm trying to name it that way so that I can see all of these shapes from each of the modes and be able to say, well, that's, that's the one where the, the uh, fifth note is Dorian. Most people don't do that, but I think it's useful, especially when we have at least the first two notes in the shape because there's only seven shapes and there's, uh, th there's only five shapes and there's seven modes. That means two shapes, in particular, the, the, uh, this is gonna be the shape number two, which you might call the major shape, also is basically the Locrian shape. So I would say it's starting on the second note major shape, <laughs> if you name it that way. And then, and then you also have position number four, which has, which is, has a similar issue in that you could, it could be the minor Phrygian or the major Locrian, depending on if you start on one of the two notes that are next to each other. Okay, so, so then uh, you could also call it, if I look for the relative major, which is going to be uh, the C, so there's my C, and if I made a lean forward shape, a bar shape, it would be an A bar shape, so from a caged system, you might call it an, an A shape. Okay, from that, then we're going inside of this shape and saying, okay, where can I, how can I find my D? If I'm, trying, if I'm in the G mixolydian shape, how do I find the D? Because I want to be playing the, how do I find the Dorian bit of it? Well, I know that the, the Mixolydian is the fifth compared to my Rosetta Stone, the major key. So Mixolydian is five. So if that's five, I could just count up five, six, seven, eight. That brings me back to eight or one. There's the C, eight or one. And then one, two, because the Dorian is the second. So Dorian is the second, that's one way that we can see it. We can also see it by shape. If I know my analogies of the shape, I'm gonna use two analogies on the shape, and that's gonna be number one. We can break out the guitar five string inf instrument plus an added E string into a two string, two string, one string breakout, which I call the house analogy, which is a major scale, all seven note analogy, this box being the house. And uh, so in, within the house, you got C up top. You've got the, 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 in the basement down here, the Phrygian, a minor mode. And then you've got the two modes that would be removed if you go from a seven note scale back to a five note, the standard five note pentatonic. That would be the one behind, the two L's. That would be Locrian right behind, and then Lydian. All right, and then, and then 
over here, you've got your double stop, and that's where the D is. It's on the double stop part of the house double stop. And then you've got the double stop house shape, which once again has your box out here, which is shifted up because of the fault line, but you can still see the box. There's the top of the box. There's the bottom of the house. It's the same house as this house, but now you have the double stop in front and the D is on the bottom of the double stop here. Looking at the other breakout that's common, three string, two string, typically seen in a five note pentatonic shape, that would be what I call the hamburger barbell analogy where within the hamburger, notice you see part of the hamburger here, here's the whole hamburger if we saw it this way. So it goes from the D to the D is encompassing the hamburger. The Dorian is encompassing the hamburger. If I move to a different mode, like the key of G and the related modes to the key of G, then even though the Dorian would still encompass the related position. So notice here, it looks like it's got four layers but this is the, if I see it from down here, here's the top bun, here's the middle, and the middle repeats because there's two E's, and here's the bottom bun in the position, position number two that we are in. If we wanted to go from a five note pentatonic and add the other two notes, we put what I call a baseball cap on top of the top bun, leaning forward in order to counterbalance that baseball cap. We also put the, the Locrian another little foot on the bottom of the base, which is the major key here. And then in the barbell part of the shape, here's the barbell where we have then the no Dorian is in the barbell. We've got the, the main, the heavy hitters for the minor, and then the main majors on the weights of the barbell, and then the ones that we remove, which is gonna be Lydian and Locrian inside the barbell, and Dorian, I think of Dorian as being removed from the barbell because it's not as heavy. Still a cool mode used all the time, but like the minor mode only has one major interval within it. And then the, the, the mix of the, uh, the Phrygian mode actually has all my, you know, it has a minor second. So it has more minors than even the main minor in terms of intervals. Whereas the Dorian has two, it has two of the major intervals, right? So I'm going to say it's it's not on the barbell because it's lighter that way. That's what I'm that's what I'm going to say in my mind to try to memorize the shapes. All right. All right. So we're going to go here. Let's just go around the shape. So there's three ways we want to learn the shape by shape. So we just went over the barbell and house analogy and then by uh, interval. So we talked a little bit about the intervals. We'll go into the intervals in more detail here and then by whole steps and half steps. So let's just run through this shape. If I start here, because we're on the bottom, it's a little wonky. So we're starting here. This is gonna be what I call the bottom from the hamburger analogy. We're at the bottom of, I'm sorry, from the house analogy, we're at the bottom of the house. That's where we start. From the hamburger analogy, we're at the top of the hamburger. Remember, there's no kink in the tuning between these two strings, only between these two strings. So it's just like normal, normal uh, relative position between these two strings and then boom boom and notice that this repeats then this bottom bit which I call the meat of the hamburger or the two note per string uh, shape is going to repeat up here and then we go into the top of the house double stop or the bottom of the uh, hamburger and if you think about it as a hamburger you've got to add that foot to the hamburger if you want all seven notes. So let's count that out. One, two, three, four, five, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So one, two, three, four, five, what? One, two, one, two, three, four, five, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so then, so then if I think about this in whole steps and half steps, I can say, all right, what are the whole steps and half steps? Remembering that in this shape, the half steps are always going to be in the box. So here's the box here on, on our shape, and here's the box here. So if we go down, we're going to say we go from one to two. That's going to be a whole step, right? Ba-boom. And then we go from two to three. 
There's where our half step is because it's at the bottom of the box. So we're at the bottom of the box here. Also remember that the half steps are always going to be like in the area where the pentatonic differs from the major scale with the notes that are removed. The notes that are removed are the half step notes, the two L's in terms of modes, the Lydian and the Locrian. So this one is the one that would be removed. And so that's another way you can kind of visualize where the half steps are gonna be. So three, and then we're gonna go from three to four. Three to four is a whole step. And then from four to five is gonna be a whole step. Four to five is a whole step. And then that repeats up top. So we have three, four to five here. Let's go five to six here. So that repeats here. Five, six uh, is a whole step because that's pinky to pointer, which is a whole step. And that six is the, is the funny interval. That's the interval that's different. So there was a, a different step going into the sixth than the related minor. And then going from the sixth to seven, that's where the half step is because we're at the top of the box again. Top of the box. And then we go seven to eight is gonna be a whole step taking us back home. All right. Okay. So then let's just run through this uh, and do our our normal intervals and then we'll try to build our chords before i do that let's try to do a joke i don't think i'm going to go as long today so i'm going to have to cut the practice session and down okay so we have the joke here let me get some coffee you know my producer phil keeps telling me that that my mouth is writing checks that my my butt can't cash which is like, and it's like, hold on a second. That doesn't make any sense. You know, that, that, I don't know if anybody's thought about this. I know this is a common phrase, but it doesn't, it doesn't really make any sense, does it? I mean, first off, I don't generally cash checks with my butt, right? I don't think I'm alone in this. I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody cashes checks with their butt. Uh, be, because, because, I mean, what what are you gonna do? You gonna you gonna clinch the check between your cheeks and then moon the you, then you moon the bank teller with it? I mean it's no it's no wonder my butt can't ca cash checks. You know if I was if I was the bank teller and someone was trying to cash the check by mooning me with it, I wouldn't I wouldn't touch the check either. I wouldn't even touch it. Get the I get the get the the security guard to kick you out of the bank, which I know that you can't probably can't even do that in California these days to get the sec security guards just really window dressing right now. But still, plus, how, how could my mouth be writing checks when my mouth is busy talking over here? I, don't, I can't be writing checks while I'm talking. And usually and usually when you write when you write a check, you give it to someone else who cashes it. You know what I mean? You don't write the check and then cash it. You one person one person writes the check that goes out of their account and then the other person gets the check they're the one that cashes it that goes into their account so what does it even mean that my mouth is writing butts my my mouth is writing checks that my butt can't cash i mean why would my mouth be writing a check to my butt you know what i mean does that make any sense that's ridiculous i mean what what do I have two separate bank accounts, one for my mouth and one for my butt? I mean, this is a, so that so that my mouth could write a check out of like one mouth bank account and my butt can can cash the check in the in the butt, the second butt. I mean, what would even be the point of that? Why would I even want to do that? Why would I even have two accounts so that I can write a check with my mouth and then cash it with my butt? I mean, <laughs> what the I don't. I don't understand. What the, the other thing that I don't get about this whole check writing process here is why can't why can't I use my hands? Why can't I use my hands? What is this a soccer game? Now the cash writing process has been turned into a soccer game, and you've banned hands from being used. If this is a soccer game, I want to be the goalie. Okay, I want to be the goalie.
So now we're going to go to the second. So if I go to the second from this D, we know that the second is going to be a two note away major second. And we can see that it's two notes away. We know that the inverse is going to be 12 minus 2, which is 10, 10 note away minor 7. So from E back to D, that therefore, 10 note away minor second, the inverse of a major is a minor. I know that the second of the Dorian, because the Dorian is the second mode of the related major, we know that, that it's one note away or one mode away. Therefore, the formula is uh, 2 minus 1 is 1 plus 2 gives me 3. 3 would be the related position to our major key. And I know, therefore, I would make a minor chord from it because the two, three, six are minor chords and the one, four, five are major chords. Beyond that, I know that it's the Phrygian mode. Where is the Phrygian mode located in our shapes? It's over here in the box, which looks a little wonky because the bottom of the box has been shifted up, but it's in the bottom left basement part of the box. And the box analogy and the hamburger analogy, it's at the top right of the bun, which might be easier to see with the full hamburger uh, to the right over here. Okay, let's build some chords on it now. So if I know it's a minor third, then most people will try to build a chord leaning forward because usually we think about from the top to the bottom and, and, and we also think about in octaves that we wanna go from the lower to the higher. So we think about the fifth most likely is right there. But obviously I can't get down to the third that way. I mean, if, if the D was up here, I'd have you know, this one, that would be my bar chord, and then there'd be a third, like, down here. But I can't really do that when there's only two strings. So then the question is, okay, and by, by the way, I'm on this E. So I'm on this E, not the D. I get a little, I got a little bit mixed up here. I'm going to keep getting mixed up as I integrate this new concept of building the chords around this, because I keep on being drawn to this uh, D and I'm also keep getting drawn to the fact that I've color coded the the one three five of the D up here but now I'm looking everything at everything in relation to the E so the the yellow green and blue aren't a whole lot of use uh, at this point right so that's just to keep that in mind all right so we've got then if I have the E and then I've got the B is up top which would be the fifth the relationship between these two strings is the same. So I can see it's a seven note away fifth because it's five, uh, six, seven. Now I need a third. So I have to go above it in order to get a third. Now I can cheat over here and I can say my third is a G. So I see a G like right there. So that makes sense. So now I've got the E and the G. Why does, now if I didn't know that, if I wasn't cheating, I could say, well, if I'm looking for a third, I'm looking for a minor third, which is a three note away minor third. But usually when I'm looking above, I might not know those intervals as well. I know the interval going from top to bottom. Therefore, I might look for the inverse, which is 12 minus the three notes away would give me a nine note away, which would be a major six, which is probably still one of the less known intervals. And beyond that, this is going across the fault line now. So, but I can see that if I looked at this shape from this G to, to E, that is gonna be a nine note away major six, which, which normally would be back here to this, that would be the six from the G, but now because of the fault line, it is up here. And therefore the inverse of a nine note away major six is 12 minus nine or three note away third. So you can see how these intervals help me. I'm gonna start practicing trying to build the chords based on the intervals, right? So I can play that if I wanted to get all three notes. Now, as I play that and I'm looking here, I'm like, all right, that's kind of a little wonky to play, but but I'm but but there we have it, right? So we've got the the E G and the B looking at the E from that perspective. Now I can see that C is in the key because it's one of the colored notes. So I can say, well, what is that? What is that C? I can cheat and say, well, the C is out here. It's the thirteenth. So, but I can say, okay, well, how, how is that? Because, well, normally I would, I would go from the C looking down. And if I look down, how many, how many notes away is it? It's five, uh, this would be five minus one would be four. So it's a four, uh, wait a sec, is that right? It would be here, would be five notes away minus one is four. So it's a major third. It's a four note away, major third away 
inverse is 12 minus 4, uh, which would be a 12 minus 4, 8 node away, minor 6. And so it would be an 8 node away, minor 6, which is going to be, why would that be the 13th? <laughs> because the 6th, the 13th is equivalent to the 6th when we think about chords because we skip every other note. So that's going to be, so I could just bar this off and I get that 13th, which is kind of tension-y to get the 13th, but it's still in the key, right? So we have that uh, is a variant that we can basically play on it. So I could also think, okay, well, let me, the other way I usually think about chords, if they were on the top two strings, is to lean back. And I could say, leaning back, I usually look for my third. So leaning back, I know that my third is back here because that's where the minor third typically is because it's five, uh, f four, it would be five notes here, four, three, three note away, minor third. So then I would need a fifth. Where's the fifth going to be? Well, if I go from top to bottom, I know that the fifth is a seven note away, perfect fifth. Twelve minus seven is five. So I'm looking for something that from that key, this note is a five note away, perfect uh, f fourth from. And normally that's right above it, but right here it's right here because of the kink in the tuning. So that's five note away, perfect fourth. Therefore, the inverse is a seven note away, perfect fifth. So from so if I look at that shape, then that B top to bottom is a five note away, perfect fourth. Bottom to top, therefore, a seven note away, perfect fifth. So that gives me my D minor shape, at least the top three strings of the D minor, right? I could add the D, you know, I could have add uh, the D by shifting my fingers out here and then adding this one. But I typically, I sometimes do that, I guess. But usually I play just like that, just those top three strings. And then I mute the string above it with like the meat of my finger right there. And so it's like, okay, I can look at that from the perspective of the D, which is kind of like the middle note now. Now, another way to see the same, you might call this a D sh part of the D shape, is I can say, well, that G right there, uh, is there a way I can get above it? The octave of that G is up here. So now I've got this shape, which also I can look at it from the perspective of this E, where now I have the fifth right here and then the third is here how do i know that's the third because if i count up this way it'd be five ten nine nine note away major six the inverse is the uh the the third the minor third uh 12 minus nine is three so i it'd be nice see how it'd be nice if i learned the if i learned the inverses to see from this to here would be if I knew what that was automatically. It's a little bit more difficult because we're going across the kink in the tuning as well. But if I don't know it automatically, and I know my inverses, then that's another way I can build my chords pretty easily, right? I could just say, what do I need right here? What's the inverse of what I need? And then look from top to bottom to see that interval and then the, and, and to work with the inverse. Okay, so that's gonna be this one. So boom, boom, boom. So we have that. Uh, let's see what else we have here. If I wanted to throw like something else in there, we know that the Phrygian has a distinctive second, which which we saw was this was the C, and I said it was the what what did I say? I said no, it's the F. The distinctive second is the F, which is the nine. So so obviously the second is right here. It's kind of hard to throw in sometimes because the second would be right next to it. But if you're playing this and your E is right here, you could slip up to this one just to throw it in there as part of. Right, and it's part of, and you know that that second will work because I'm in the Phrygian mode. If I was in another mode, another minor key, another minor chord, like the Aeolian up here, if I move this up to playing in uh, A, then I wouldn't have, well, let's not, I won't get too bogged down. I wouldn't have the second involved in it, right? So it'd be, it'd be because right now I'm on the second, okay. But well, it would be out here. Here's the A I'd be going to here. And then I've got this one and this one. 
and th but I don't have the second right there. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Let's keep going. Let's push forward to the next one. That's enough of that. My brain is hurting already. It's been it's been a long morning already over here. It's been a little noisy today. So we're gonna say this is the fifth. Oh, are you tired? Yes, I'm tired. You're tired every day. You say you're tired. I know. But the, today is like, seriously, man, like, it's been crazy stuff going on here, dude. You don't even know. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're going to say this is going to be the third. So we know the third of uh, the Lydian is going to be a three note away minor third. I can see the, the three note away interval. The inverse is 12 minus three, which is going to be uh, a nine, nine note away major six. So D to F, three note away major third, F to D, nine note away major six. Okay, and then I could say that uh, the third of the Dorian is two minus one is one, plus three gives me mode number four, Lydian, and the fourth of the major scale, if I go up here, I know that the fourth is would build a major chord because the one, four, five are the ones that I build a major chord from. Beyond that, I know it's the Lydian mode, which has a uh, distinctive fourth interval. It's an augmented fourth interval. Okay, where is it located? With the house analogy, uh, it's gonna be located in the box. So it's in the box. Where am I? Here, here's the D, here, oh, it's here. It's in this box, although the box is shifted up, it's on the right side of the box. It's the one that would be removed if we went from the seven note down to a five note pentatonic. And uh, in terms of the hamburger analogy, it's not in the hamburger. It's the one that we would imagine putting a hat on the hamburger and the bill of the hat uh, reaching out to the right here. All right, uh, if we build a chord from it, we know that it's gonna be a major chord. So again, normally I would think leaning forward where I always have the power chord. So there's my fifth, right? Leaning forward, I see my fifth over here. And then I can say, okay, well, where's, I need a third then. So this time I need a major third. So if I think about the inverse, I can say, well, the, the, uh, the it's a major third, four, way to ma four note away major third, 12 minus four is eight note away minor uh, six. So where, where's the minor six? We're gonna say that that's gonna be the here. It's a, it's a minor six, which is the A, a minor six. So that look, this from here to here looks like a major six, but it's a minor six because of the kink in the tuning. How do I know? Because he says five, 10, nine, eight. Eight note away minor six from the A to the F, therefore the inverse is 12 minus eight, which is a four note away, uh, four note away major third. So I can say, all right, if I'm here, then I'm going, if I'm on, uh, where was it? I'm on this F, and then I'm going to this A, and then I'm going to this uh, C. So that's a little wonky. I'd have to mute, I'd have to mute possibly the G if I played that. Does that make sense? One, five, and then three. So now I've got the one, the, the F, the A, the C. Now what if I played the G out? That would be the ninth. So the G's still in the chord. So if I played the open G, then I would have a ninth in there. Okay. And then I have, an, I have a finger that's open here. So I could play, I could try to put this finger down on the, this one. Yeah, yeah, if I put, I could try to put my finger down here to the D, and that's what I would normally think of as a D shape looking from the position of here. But if I look at the position of the F, then I would be adding the 13, which is equivalent to the six. That's a little wonky to play though. So, okay, let's try leaning back. So what if I lean back, then I know I've got my major third, because it's a major chord. 
So that's pretty clear. I could be like, okay, there's the major third. That's not a problem. But then the fifth, uh, I have to lean forward or go above it to go to the fifth. And the fifth is usually like, like right above it, right? Because it's a perfect fourth going down. But if I didn't know that, I know I'm looking for a seven note away perfect fifth. Inverse 12 minus seven is a five note away perfect fourth. So, so the five note away perfect fourth is uh, is going to be this C, right? And therefore, from C to F, that would be a five note away perfect fourth. Therefore, from F to C is a seven note away uh, perfect fifth. So, so there's my shape. So it's inverted. There's my there's my root, and that's of course my D. You know the D shape, D major shape that I'm playing an F chord with, with the root here, the five here, and the third here. Okay, and then if I could bar that off, I'd be going back to this F there. So we can play it that way. And then I could try to say, okay, well, can I take that, uh, that A, and instead of playing it uh, down there, maybe I can play it up here, the octave up top. So now I've got, now I've got boom, boom, and then I can play boom. And this, this is actually the, it looks a little wonky, but it's actually like the C shape, because if you moved this one up here, you can see you have your C shape, which would be the C shape would be like this, to, from here to here. Well, this is C. But then, but then, I, but then the problem is I have this open string if I play just uh, if I play this 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 and this So to really get the 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 fifth in there I'd have to reach back to here, which means I usually switch my fingers like that That would be our C lean back C shape and then I could always add this added F which is the root here so notice I can play it like that. I could play it like this, although I'm missing the fifth. I could play it like this, or I can play it like this. A lot of people really like this. I don't do that quite so much, but it's an easy position to play. Uh, so just removing the pinky, right? Just taking the pinky off. You might do that first and then add the pinky, <laughs> just to give you some time. Okay, so then let's move on. Move on, please, for crying out loud spending all day doing this. Let's go back to the, let's go to the fourth. The fourth is gonna be a five note away. So I'm back to the D, the fourth above it. I know that's gotta be a five note away perfect fourth. How do I know? Because, uh, wait a sec, no, that's not where I'm going. I'm going to this A up here. We're going up. Five note away perfect fourth. Uh, wait a second. No, I'm on the G. For crying out loud, you're confusing people. All right, it's five notes away. One string difference, five note away, perfect four. Five notes in between. Inverse, 12 minus five is seven. So if I play from G to D, that'd be a seven note away, perfect fifth. The fourth of the Dorian is two minus one is one, plus four, which give us the fifth, meaning it would be the relative fifth position to the major. If it's the fifth position to the major, I'd build a major chord because the one, four, five would have a major chord, which means it has a major third. But beyond that, it's the mixolydian, which means that it has a distinctive minor seven in it. Okay, that's cool. And uh, where does it live? Well, it's not in the house, even though it's part of the majors. It's over here in the double stop. Uh, it's over here. This is in the two note per string hamburger part of the shape or flat and in the hamburger shape It's in the meat of the hamburger on the left hand side. Okay, how do I build a chord? Well now I can't go down at all Which is normally what we think of first to build our chords I have to go up and when I go up the first thing I usually think of is right above it Because that's where the fifth is gonna be How do I know that because if I go from if I was to think about it, I was like I'd be like, okay if I I need I need a fifth and I need a third so let's look at the fifth first because that's somewhat easier to find when I'm going up oftentimes 
and that's going to be a 7 note away perfect 5th. 12 minus 7 is 5, 5 note away perfect 4th. So I know that this distance is from the D is a 5 note away perfect 4th, therefore the inverse is a 7 note away perfect 5th. So there's that, and then I just need the third, and I know I'm on a major chord, the third is a four note away major third. The inverse, therefore, is 12 minus four, which is eight, eight note away minor six. So if I look up top, I see that's the B, and I sh that will give me the eight note away if I go from B to here, right? Why? Because it's five, 10, nine, eight. So from here to here, eight note away minor six, and therefore from G to B, is a uh, major third. So we're looking, this is the shape. So again, we could just kind of memorize that, that shape. It's a nice shape to know. It's part of our bar uh, shape uh, for the G, because if I barred off the entire G, it would look like that. So if I just take that bottom bit of the shape, we're taking this, if I did that right, which is all we need oftentimes if we're you know, working in that part. So then, so then I could, so there's, there's that, uh, that's mainly the main shape we would go to going that way. I mean, I could lean back and pick up this B that's open down here. Uh, well, what I'm on, I'm on the G, I could pick up that B that's open and then look for the, and play an open D or something, but that's pretty, we're, options are limited at the bottom of the guitar there. So let's leave it at that. Let's move forward, move on. Nothing to see here. What What if I can add something else though, just to play with it that way, I could say. Well, I have that, uh, but I know, what could I, What else could I reach here? One way I might look, play with this is say, I could reach like that G with my pinky. I know that's in the shape. What is that? Well, that G then uh, is another is another root. So that's cool. So that's basically obviously I'm just playing part of you know the bar shape again. So is there anything else I can reach that's interesting? I can get that G. I mean, I might be able to get to that. D I can. Wait a second. I might be able to get that D. That's a reach for me. Hold on a second. Something meant right here. Something meant right here. That way. Maybe I can. I don't know. If I could reach that D, that would be another fifth. Anyways, let's move on. Move on, dang it. I have that F. I could probably reach that F. All my, I just said move on. Okay, wait a second though. Like, <laughs> that F is reachable. I, I gotta try it. That's just bar to the bar chord again. So if I, isn't it? No, that would be the seventh. So if I reach the F, that would be the seventh. And that's the, uh, that's the, that's the one I should be concentrated on because that's the, so that's part of, if I played the full bar chord like this, uh, from the G major bar chord. What's going on here? And then I lifted up that. And if I play just the bottom of it, it would be here, but then I could play, I could play it like that, which is not too bad of a shape to hold. Or I might just play like these three to get the feel of it. But then I'm missing the root. <laughs> the root seems important, but you can actually, anyway, uh, <clears throat> let's move on. Moving on for crying out loud. What are you doing? I don't know. Practice session. Uh, let's go to the 
A. Wait, no, I'm not on that A. I'm on this one. So five note away, going up. So there's a five note away, a seven note away, perfect fifth. I know that because it's five, six, seven, seven note away, perfect fifth. And uh, I know that the fifth of a Dorian is two minus one is one plus five is six. So it's the sixth of the relative major, which means I'm gonna make a minor chord from it because the two, three, and six are minor chord constructions. Beyond that, it's the main minor, it's the Aeolian. So, so again, if I'm on, so then where does it live? It's not in the house because it's a minor. Uh, it's going to be in the double stop, uh, and it's in the meat of the hamburger and the flat position is where we're at here. And if I build a chord from it, I know, again, the fifth is right above it this time. So I always know the fifth is like right above it. So if I'm on like this A, I have the fifth, but, the, but now I need a minor uh, third. So the minor third is going to be here. And again, if I, so how can I know that? So it looks kind of like an A shape, but, but it's at the bottom and it's inverted. And I'm looking at the root is actually the bottom note. How do I know that this, this is a minor third away? Because it's a three note away minor third, 12 minus three is a nine. So this from here to here is a nine note away uh, major six, which looks like, it's a, looks like it should be a 10 note away minor seven but because of the kink in the tuning, nine note away. And so inverse would be a three note away minor third. All right, let's stop it there. Let's go to the top of the guitar and redo the G from the top, which will help us to see things from our normal perspective when we build bar chords. So if I go back to my G, so now this repeats up top with a G. And if I build my chord from here, then I know I could do my I'm like, oh, that's my normal bar chord where I'd lean forward like this. Boom, boom, boom. That's my E shaped bar chord from here to here. And so that's just my E shape that I was breaking out at the bottom of that shape. And so that's great. And then I have my lean. And then if I wanted to add the distinctive seven here, because I know the Mixolydian has a minor seven, I can lift up my finger. So I lift it up with this finger, revealing my bar, my barred finger, which is the F, which is going to be that seven. So that's nice. Uh, that's nice. What else can I do with this bar shape just to just to play around with it? I can obviously I'm on the Mixolydian right now. So that what's cool about this is I can reach up beyond here outside of the shape and pick up the third out here so I can go back. And right, so I can pick up that one, which is the third again. I can even go out way out here and pick up the 11 if I wanted, if I could reach it. in between my plane and then and notice from the from the perspective of our three pillars three note per string shape I've got my three pillars right here so that means I can go or a hamburger 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 so that's kind of interesting to add into my note my shape number five so then I can say okay what if I, what if I, what if I let go of this one? And I was like, I have my normal bar shape like this, but then I'm like dropping the D. Then I would pick up the C. I could do that. So I would drop the fifth. I already have another fifth down here, so that's cool and I would be picking up the C, which is an 11th. The 11th is equivalent to the four, right? So I could be like. And then 
then dr and then go dro drop the drop the other finger to get to the F. I could drop both of them. Right, and then okay, that's interesting to know. Uh, what if? What if? I reached up to that E. That E is the thirteenth, which is equivalent to the six. So I could be like. reach up to that and I could most likely reach to this A even if I was to kind of reach out there that would be the ninth which is equivalent to the four I might even be able to get this fifth right there so one five four so now I'm reaching these three G D A My brain is hurting. I'm a little slow today, I think. I'm slower than normal. I'm tired. Are you tired? Yes, I'm tired. You're tired every... Okay. Look, you don't even understand. It's crazy over here. I gotta... I need to take a nap. <laughs>